Go for it. Oh. I have a question specifically uh, for June and Andrew. Um, I, I'd like to like have you both compare um, because you have you you study a lot of photographs, both of you, and how do you like examine represented space in photography and and find meaning? Like, what is your process, and how is it different between your two fields? Um, I, I, it's interesting. Um, the RISD archives. Um, one, we have historic photographs of, um, you know, t to look at the RISD campus, I think um, of the 50 or 60 buildings we have, um, our oldest goes back to 1774, which pre-exists RISD. So we have a lot of imagery that pre-exists RISD. Um, we actually have student, uh, who, students who have majored in photography here. Going back to the 1960s, we have their senior and graduate work in the archives too. And um, I, I like to make the distinction with students and looking at <coughs> photography in the archives that um, the archives has this kind of um, leveling impact where um, we don't nef necessarily distinguish between manuscript papers and um, ephemeral posters and photographs. And these are all artifacts. Um, they now are kind of adaptedly reused as historic images or artifacts uh, documenting history, but that's a second life uh, that runs counter to how they were originally created and used. Um, so um, I like to um, talk about, when I talk to students about these photos in the archives, we are collecting them for reasons other than aesthetic reasons. Mm -hmm. And when that work crosses into a museum, uh, the museum may actually have this very same print we have by Emmett Gowan as a student uh, but they're read entirely differently in the collection. So, um, you know, that's, those are questions I ask myself and I, I try to be aware of, of um, you know, the context in the collection in which something resides could have two entirely different meetings and interpretation. So, I don't know if that gets at your question. So. I think uh, this really resonates with uh, the ways I approach photography as well. Um, and I'm really interested in the triad relationship between the subject, the photographer, and the viewer, and perhaps even more um, uh, stemming from that relationships, those relationships. So um, that's how basically I approach. I, I approach uh, different kinds of sets of photographs through these relationships, sometimes the rupture between these relationships, as you saw in the Kowloon Walled City photographs, which doesn't exist anymore, but uh, they are brought back again to build a different kind of connections and relationships with the people who live in Hong Kong or for diaspora communities outside Hong Kong reminiscing the colonial period. So these kind of connections and networks and sometimes uh, ruptures between the networks are something that I'm really interested in. And um, as Andrew mentions, the archives, I think, are just really interesting bodies of, of not just physical objects, but really creating these different networks and, and connections. So recently, I've been approaching archives as sort of multi-sensory eventful things than just uh, stacks of photographs that I browse through because of the very things that I mentioned as I started talking about Kowloon Wall City photos that, you know, something that brings me or anybody else like an archivist to these bodies of uh, works, whether it is through learned knowledge or experienced multisensorial things. So that's how I approach, and I think it's very relevant to RISD photography archives that you deal with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? Oh, Steve, should I get you a mic? <laughs> oh, I can speak up. I was just <laughs> going to ask John. Uh, Dove's Press, I think, was a print type or uh, that was designed to sort of be expressive of the content. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? And what relationship is this, the work that you're trying to do with that earlier idea? Uh, of what, of, of using sort of like uh, 
design and typography to, to be expressive? Of, of the content, yeah. Of the content. So, I mean, he's famous for his Bible, where he starts it in the beginning, and it's just one long I. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have a, I'm, for my own purposes, I make a, a distinction between, uh, I think of, there's poetry, and then there is concrete poetry, and then there is visual poetry. So with, with for me, concrete means that you take um, the material support of graphically represented language, and you, um, and you make it behave like objects in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then you would, and then with visual poetry, uh, where you're, you're starting with something like a, a huge initial letter, that, that you're making it expressive of maybe something a little bit more abstract, like a, a fundamental idea of, of, of height and beginning, importance. And and uh, and th th it becomes abstract in that sense. And then there, then there's a an, sort of like a an infinite uh, granularity to to the possibilities for 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 using the way something is uh, typeset or designed that can also be expressive. But the but the other thing that I do is that for I, me, I make a radical distinction between between the what that is and what the language is, right? So the, so, and the, and the, it's it's never, it's it is radical because it's 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 only language when it when it's read, for for me in my current thinking, but you but there were as, there are aspects that are read, including the design, that uh, that you wouldn't be able to leave to one side, when you were trying to work out what it meant. And, and, and meaning for me is sort of like a simpl in a simplified way, is it divides into significance, which is sort of purely paraphrasable, symbolic practice, and affect, which is, which is not. You can, you can talk about affect, and affect speaks, but affect is, uh, is, is precisely emotion, how something makes you feel, all, all of those things. And meaning is, Absolutely, both of those things. So, so you know, punctuation, uh, uh, that the arrangement of the language, that 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 is speaking directly to affect, but could also bleed into signification, and and becomes a part of meaning as a whole. So, I'm just curious, um, the use of audio. I mean. Would you combine, would you use uh, someone reading and the word? Absolutely, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I can. I, this is the the. I I personally don't make it. In other words, spoken language uh, is well. For me, writing is a different language, right? It's a it's a it's a dialect. It's a graphilect, in in the is, which is what Walter Ong would have called, talk, called it. So you you think of it's it's English. It's not English. It's a dialect of English, and it's almost another language. So you practice in writing. You practice in one dialect. If you practice in in orality, what I call orality, a u, you practice in English and in perhaps in a high English or a strange English or poetic English. So, so the, but the language could be very similar. You know, you could do a translation from one dialect to the other and they could, and the, you know, the significance in Africa could be very close and that could be part of the, the process. But the language doesn't care whether it's, spoke, the, langu the language itself doesn't care whether it's an orality or not. In the, in the, in the, in the immersive, uh, 3D space. I try and encourage students to, you know, they can work with the graphics, but they should also be working with orality. They should be working with voiceover. They should be doing. They should be doing interesting things with voiceover, treating it like a medium, not just like a, not just like an illustration. Thank you, John. At what point are you willing to forego uh, legibility or intelligibility? Um, you know, as it becomes experiential, um, 
are you in effect uh, communing, commu uh, communicating the experience and not necessarily the uh, literal um, signification of what the words themselves mean? Yeah, I, I mean, to, 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 be, to, to be polemical, I'm, I, I'm pretty hardcore on that. I think things that are illegible are illegible. And uh, which, which does not mean you shouldn't do them, but, but the, the, the aesthetics that you're going for if you produce something that is deliberately illegible is different from the aesthetics you're going for when you're trying to make, trying to make it re readable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of language out there that, that is very difficult to understand, but is very beautiful. And, and, and that's more interesting to me than language that has been deliberately made illegible unless, unless it's got an aesthetic of its own. Mm -hmm. But the but the, but and then there's a and then there's in between places where you're you're making it illegible in a way which you can read, like if you like one of the, my favorite thing is that my favorite thing at the moment is that if you replace every o, every lowercase o with an e, right or an a, you can replace you can replace both the o's and a's with an e in any piece of English text. It's really easy to read still, right? Because, it, because the words look more or less right, and you know what's happened. You, know, you, you don't even have to be told. So, so in, that, in that case, you make something that the robots would find, have a little bit of trouble with for, for the first week when it was happening. But, but humans would have no trouble at all, right? They're still reading. But the robots are going to be, have their indexes messed up for, for, like I say, a week until they learn what's going on. So, so, so that, you know, you're producing something that is illegible in conventional terms, but it's not illegible to humans. It's just illegible to uh, people who think spelling is important. Because Shakespeare didn't think spelling was important. Orthography is, orthography is a terrible thing. We don't need it. Um, I'd like to actually ask a, a brief question. Um, June, the, the, the visual, the pictures we saw of, of Callan City, there's something very striking about the, how they look. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on why the visual grammar that's conveyed in those images is so striking. And uh, as, as a related question, I'm curious, John, where you think the line between evocative visual grammar and, and linguistics is? So, could you a uh, little bit more elaborate what you mean by striking and what other words did you use? Uh, well, I think, there's, I think there's a reason that in certain um, subsets of culture, Kowloon City represents a type of uh, utopic anarchism and sort of order in lawlessness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it comes through in the visual mm -hmm. representations. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if you have a vocabulary that would like describe that. Um, I think the photographs have enough vocabularies in it. So articulating it with certain words wouldn't really, I think, matter. But I understand what you mean by this lawlessness that is in a way contained and that's articulated these photographs of um, I think some of the photographs I showed is these dark alleys that are trashed and it looks like it's going to uh, crumble down or um, butchers who are illegally butchering the pigs and so on. So they had this sort of uh, underground black market uh, economies on their own and I think that's articulated through um, especially Greg Gerard's photographs where he's just entering into these places and the residents and the workers there are actually um, were welcoming um, Gerard into these places where these things happen. So I, I find the relationship between Gerard and the people who live there who really don't care about what he's doing because everyone is doing their own things. That's articulated, I, I think, in a way um, in these photographs that appear to be striking, and I, I think that may be the kind of language that uh, you're, you're <coughs> looking at, perhaps the language of this interesting relationship where the photographer, someone who doesn't live there, don't belong there, is entering into these places and, and articulating that to the audience, perhaps. Is that 
very language, I think, um, that you are looking for, perhaps. Thanks. Um, well, I think I can, um, if you think of what, well, I, I don't, I haven't, can't check the etymology because I don't have, I suppose I could get my phone out, but that would be obnoxious. Um, evocative means to, I guess, to, you know, spark you to vocalize, right? To, to, to speak to yourself about it. And, and, uh, and the, the walled city in those photographs, you know, um, we didn't mention William Gibson, uh, and the you know walled city in in cyber culture was 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 very important and and Blade Runner and so and th those so so a lot of that uh, you know there's a you know what came first was it was it urban you know the urban walled city or or was it some I idea of it uh, and and I think that's a bit of a chicken and egg and egg problem and and the so evocation is is what uh, people who work with language that's what they have to do, and then uh, and then when we, or one of the th I guess it's not all that we do, but when we experience uh, artwork, we definitely do uh, talk to ourselves, and I don't mean that we talk in in an articulated way, but we we're we're, we're running through we're, you know we do a little bit of quantum linguistics in our head and we. And we produce little poems about things that we really like, which is exactly what you do when you see that the beautiful picture of of of, of, of the walled city. Can can I ask why was it, was that space around it was that always there or was that was that preparatory to destroying it? What space are you talking well, about? Well, in the, in that in that city that, that the, where the where the ground is sort of flat. That's always that was always that was there. Was always there. Right. Okay. I have to ask, um, seeing those photos of the interior of the city, I mean, it strikes you psychologically, like what would it be like to live in there? And I, you know, are there oral histories with former residents where they talk about how they perceive and navigate the world um, now that they're no longer in there? I would think your psychology would change. Um, mm -hmm. And do they express that? There are. Tens of interviews included in the book that I mentioned that was uh, republished in 2014. And they interviewed, the photographer and the publisher interviewed the residents uh, a couple of years before it was demolished. So there is a lot of anxiety. What's going to happen to my life once I go outside, outside this complex? So it's more like the more conveying the anxiety of not being able to live in this space, even though they look really confining and small and lawless and what have you. But uh, it, the interviews really convey um, you know, the uncertainty of living outside what was organically growing or grown at the time. And we, they didn't follow up on the people who left, so we really don't know, but we can only imagine. But Hong Kong, it's not just Kowloon Walled City, but in many other places, you'll see this dense living spaces. So it's it's actually not very uncommon until still today. So. All right. Well, unfortunately, due to time, we're going to end there. But let's thank our panelists another time. Thank you.